Hey, what's going on, folks? It's uh, Larry with Packmaster's Dog Training. So I put out a couple of e-collar videos with Mango, my five-month-old Belgian Malinois puppy this week. It was the first time she ever had a video on. You, you guys saw that. Extremely dry and boring, but that's how it is when you start, okay? So I've been slammed with questions, e-collar questions, and uh, I guess I'm kind of surprised at this day and age there's so much information out there, not just from me, but from a lot of people, you know? And so I asked you guys earlier, send me the questions you want me to answer, and I will do my best to answer them. Um, and here's the thing. This is the way I do things. Doesn't mean it's the only way. Doesn't mean it's the, the best way. Some may disagree with me. And it, it doesn't mean that there's not more than one way, you know, to get to the same destination. There's plenty of different ways to do this, guys. The things that I do with the e-collar have developed over years. It really has. Basically from working with a lot of the best of the best and a lot of the worst of the worst. And so I didn't create or invent anything new, okay? But the system I use, like someone pointed out on, on one of the videos yesterday, still hard to grasp that some people don't get it. It's so basic and simple but effective and that's true it's very simple and effective and too many are making it way too complicated so again i'll do the best i can answer the questions if you disagree with it totally okay um, this is just the way i do it i'll answer them the best i can all right so the very first question i got is from jj what's up jj hope you're doing well buddy how do you teach down with an e-collar jj thinks he knows the answer and i'm, I'm sure he does very simple, I don't teach the down with the e-collar. I don't teach any of the commands with the e-collar. And I've said that thousands of times, if not hundreds of thousands of times before, okay? By the time I put the e-collar on the dog, I want those basic things to be known very, very well. Very, very well, all right? Um, so in other words, I'm not putting the e-collar on the dog for the first time. The dog's never felt the e-collar and then trying to get positions or commands or behaviors from the dog by using the stimulation, by forcing the dog to do it. If that's your thing, that's your thing, but it's not my thing. It's not how I do it, you know? Um, and with this being said about the down command, I've talked about this before in videos too. If I get a dog, whether it's my own dogs or a client dog, that will not go down easily, or cannot be lured into a down with food, I don't do it. I wait, okay? If it does in the beginning, fine. Then we'll work on it and practice it without the e-collar. But if a dog does not go down in the beginning, I don't force it. I never want to create that conflict in the training. I want there to be as little conflict as possible, okay? And then later on down the road, maybe a week later, a week and a half, two weeks, it doesn't matter. Once that dog and I have that trust, that bond together, and the dog understands what is expected, then I can push the issue a little bit. But what happens, guys, is at that point, the dog no longer fights it, okay? And with a lot of dogs, what happens, you saw it with Halo, our German Shepherd that we trained for the soldier. You guys seen it with Mango. Sophia taught both those dogs to down. What happens is these dogs that refuse to go down and you don't force them, what happens very quickly is down becomes their cleanest, most known, favorite, best command every time. I'm not exactly sure why, but it does. So I don't force it and I don't teach the down or any other command with the e-collar. Now, some people will say, well, you teach the recall with the, with the e-collar. I can understand why someone would think that, but I look at it a little differently, guys. And again, this is just me. I'm actually using the recall to teach the e-collar, if that makes any sense, all right? Because you remember in the beginning, the only thing I care about is teaching the dog what that strange stimulation means at very low levels, the lowest level that the dog possibly perceives over and over and over till it's very comfortable with it and understands it. Then I could start using it for many different things. So I went a little long on that question, but I don't teach the down or any other command with the e-collar, okay? Uh, Susanna, I didn't ask you to make a video, but I have several questions. How exactly do you use e-collar stim to signal recall, nonverbal, but also to reinforce or strengthen other obedience commands with the same level length of stim. My brain is having a hard time wrapping around this concept. Um, let me see if I, if I get this straight, Susanna. Okay, so in the beginning, when I'm conditioning the dog to the e-collar, um, something I started doing you know, within the past couple of years is teaching 
that recall non-verbally, all right? So for my dogs and a lot of client dogs, a lot of my clients live out on farms and have a lot of property, and for my dogs, I want them to understand their default response to where if they're off leash and away from me and they just feel a tap from the e-collar is to turn and come to me, unless they hear a different command, okay? So in other words, if they're 100 yards from me and I tap, tap the e-collar, they turn and they come running. That's what they're trained to do. But as far as also reinforcing and strengthening other obedience commands with the same level or length of stem, don't get caught up on the level so much. That's not important because every situation is going to be different, all right? So once we get those first few days out of the way and we're doing the conditioning process, teaching the dog over and over, right? First thing I do is usually with the recall and the go away, the place over and over, lots of rewards, lots of leash work, just teaching the dog what the stim means. Then once they have a pretty good grasp on it, it could be day two, it could be day three, then I'll start adding really simple things. Usually the next thing is adding it to the sit command. So they start seeing it in different pictures. So it's not just come to me or go away. Now we start using the things that the dog knows very, very well, okay? And so I don't condition the e-collar to every command. Someone asked me that yesterday. I'm not going through the conditioning process with all the commands, okay? So we do the conditioning process normally. Just teaching the dog what the e-collar means, right? It has nothing to do with obedience. Once the dog grasps it, grasps it very well, then we can add it to all the known commands that the dog knows. And it won't take that long to where we can start using it to stop unwanted behavior. So I hope that answers your question, Susanna. I don't know if I quite understand it. Don't get so caught up on the, the level or you also said, what did it say, the length of the stim. Maybe this is what you're talking about. Once the dog is conditioned, okay, you guys know I, I, can, I do a few different things in the conditioning process. One of the first things I do is with the continuous button held down, I give the command when the dog turns, I release the pressure from the e-collar, right? But you have to understand something, guys. Once we're done with the conditioning phase and the dog is getting trained and understands the e-collar well, you know, once we get through that intermittent phase, I'm no longer using the e-collar before a command. Never, okay? Once we get to that more of a maintenance phase or towards the end of the intermittent phase where the dog's really doing well and it's pretty trained and we're starting to get it out and about in, in real world situations, then what happens is I'm no longer using it before the command, okay? It's there if, if necessary, if needed. So for example, we're out at a park and the dog is 50 yards away and I say, hey, Mango, come and she doesn't come immediately, that's where I can follow up with the tap from the e-collar immediately after the command. And then she's always going to respond to the last command given, okay? I can guarantee that, 100%. That's how we train, but that's what we teach the dog. And where a lot of people fail is they do the conditioning phase and then they don't spend enough time in that intermittent phase. You gotta understand, guys, repetitions are so important to whatever you're doing in dog training. And it takes a lot more repetitions than people think. You have to do it over and over and over for the dog, <coughs> excuse me, for the dog to truly know it, okay? You have to do it a lot. With that being said, there's two sides of the coin here where people struggle. A lot of people stay in the conditioning phase way too long and they're scared to move forward. You don't want that either, okay? And on the other side of the coin, you get too many people that jump out of the conditioning phase way too fast and move forward and get the leash off the dog because the dog was doing so well. You don't want that either. You want to find that middle guideline. You want to move forward fairly quickly, but in small increments, okay? Hope that helps. Stuart, how do I start with an e-collar and how young is too young to begin? Before you start with an e-collar, Stuart, I want you to be able to train a dog with markers and lures, you know, clicker, verbal markers, using food. You have to understand the timing and how dogs learn. I don't want anyone just to pick up an e-collar and start trying to train a dog. It never works. It never works, okay? With that being said, I literally have thousands of emails in my inboxes with people just saying great things that they've been able to train their dog off leash, but they've taken the time and they've learned how to train dogs first. Then they add the tool. Once you have an understanding of how dogs learn, 
you understand how to teach a dog all the basics by using luring and marking and all that good stuff, um, you have to be able to use a leash first. If you can't train a dog with just a leash and a flat buckle collar, then you shouldn't put your hands on an e-collar. So you have to have a little bit of ability and understand how dogs learn before you want to go to the e-collar, okay? Otherwise, you're going to make things bad. As far as age, there's no set age. I know people that start as puppies, 12 weeks old. You know, I'm not a big fan of that, but again, that's just me, you know? Um, five months old is the earliest I start, and that was with just with my dogs. But my dogs were completely fully trained off leash at five months old before they ever saw the e-collar. When people call me and want to do a board and train or start private classes and they want to do the e-collar, I like six or seven months at least, at least. You know, a little bit older, I prefer even better. But I'm not a big fan on going too young. But even if you do go younger than that, you have to understand, again, back to what I said before, we're not doing it in a way where you're slapping an e-collar on a young dog and trying to get the obedience out of the dog. If you're going to do a very young dog, and to me, four or five months is young. For me, the only thing I want is that dog feeling that sensation slightly over and over and over hundreds of times to where it's second nature. Okay, when they feel the stimulation from the e-collar, it's completely normal. And then you can start building on that. Okay, time is very important. Don't rush things, don't push things, okay? Relationship is still number one. If you have a, a crummy relationship with your dog, don't go put a knee collar on and start forcing things. And the same thing, listen, if you're an awesome, if you're an awesome dog trainer, an e collar is gonna make you better. But if you're a terrible dog trainer, an e collar is gonna make you worse. So when I hear people say, well, this dog is a good candidate for e-collar training, I disagree with that 100%. I think every dog is a good candidate for e-collar training. I've never met one that wasn't. They're all good candidates for e-collar training because it's a wonderful tool when in the right hands and used properly as a small part of an overall training program. You guys have to remember, the e-collar is a very small part of what I do with every dog, especially my own. My dogs don't have e-collars on very often. You see that. Okay, so it's just a small part, guys. Let's see what we got here next. Where can I purchase it? And will it help me with commands to stop jumping on people? Well, it depends what brand you buy, okay? I use the uh, mini educator from e-collar technologies. There's other brands that you could use. You don't skimp on an e-collar. You don't buy garbage brands. You don't go to Amazon or, or Petco and, and buy an e-collar for $50. You just don't do that. They're way too inconsistent and many are too harsh on the lowest levels for dogs. Spend, you know, you're going to spend $200 and, and that's not a lot of money and it's going to last you a long time, but it's well worth it. As far as stopping behaviors, here's the thing. Who was I speaking to here? Um, Tony, right? Lisa, I'm sorry. As far as stopping behaviors, guys, once the training's done, the beautiful thing about the e-collar, there is no easier way to stop unwanted behaviors. I'm not a fan of putting a knee collar on a dog, fresh, brand new, the dog's not been trained with it, and just nailing it to stop it unwanted behavior. Unfortunately, a lot of people do that. I'm not a fan of that. You know, if someone comes to me and wants that, that's not going to work. I'm not going to work with you because that's not how I do things. Um, if your dog is jumping on you, you should be able to stop that very easily without a knee collar. With that being said, if the dog hasn't stopped then you can't figure out how, if you put the time in and condition the dog properly and train the dog properly, you can. You definitely can, but I'm not a huge fan of it. I'd rather that come from you, not the tool, okay? And it's a very easy thing to fix very fast. All right, so that was Lisa, e-collar techno, okay. Okay, Kyle, I get this question a lot, Kyle. Thoughts on using a vibration recall or tone recall versus stimulation or thoughts on them tone vibration stimulation in general okay i've made videos about this i've received hate mails and death threats and all that good stuff basically um i'm not a fan of the vibration only collars and you know using vibration for recall and and here's why and i've talked about it at length for one all these people that are flocking to the vibration stuff you're basically saying you do have a little negative thoughts on e-collars that then you're not a hundred percent comfortable with e-collar training if you have to go to a vibration only and there are there are situations where the vibration let me go back i have been more open-minded in the 
recent because I have used them for certain things. I have one now. Um, here's what I tell people, guys. I get messages from people all the time say, hey, my dog's off leash and he comes with the vibration recall every time. And I believe them. I don't think they're lying. But what happens the first time the dog doesn't come and all you have is a vibration only collar on? What happens? You're screwed because there is no aversive from the vibration. Yes, it's zero to 100. 100 doesn't feel much, much different than a number one. Okay, you have to be prepared for what if. So if you were to train with the vibration collar, but there is a backup to where the dog is also trained with stimulation, then, then have at it. I, I don't care. As long as you're prepared for what if and you're fair to the dog, you're not setting the dog up to fail. But if you only have an e-collar on what, that only vibrates, there are no consequences for the wrong behavior. And a lot of times when there are no consequences for the wrong behavior for a dog that's off leash, that could, that could be deadly. Okay, that could be deadly. So I'm not a big fan of it there. Now, with that being said, there are people that can, that can benefit from the vibration only collar. You know, if there's elderly people who need help inside the home, you know, and, and they're going to use it for certain, it could definitely provide some benefit there. If you have someone that's 100% dead against e-collar training, absolutely, then use it. There's places where the e-collars are banned, absolutely, then use it. Just make sure you teach it very well. I'll tell you where it benefits me very, very much. Um, and I started using it with my boarding trains for this. What I've noticed over the years with a lot of dogs is once the e-collars, you know, get taught to the dog, once the dog understands the concept very well, um, if you have, let's say, a dog that likes to bark in its crate or its pen when you're boarding it, you can't leave an e-collar on your dog 24 hours a day. It's going to develop sores. You just can't do it. I would never do that. But what I started doing, and uh, I think it was Emmy, the Great Dane that you guys saw me train, was the first dog I did it with. Every now and then, 2 o'clock in the morning, she'd start barking like crazy in her pen. And I guess she did it at home, too. Well, I was like, enough is enough. So that's when I purchased the vibration-only collar from eCollar Technologies. And what I did was I put that on her before we went to bed. This way she could wear that straight through the night. You know, there's no contact points. It's not going to cause any irritation or harm. And I took the remote to bed with me. And what I figured I would do, I did train her with it first. I did condition her to the vibration-only collar. You know, I did a few days of it and she did very well, but I'll get to the end of that too. So I went to bed, I had the remote, and if she was going to start barking at two o'clock, she had every day, I would tap the vibration and kind of interrupt that and make her think, whoa, what was that? But what happened was she never did. She never barked once I had that on her at night. And I can also use it for Luca, okay? He won't bark or get carried away if he's in the crate or the pen, you know, if he's got an e-collar on too. It just kind of settles him down and really makes him even keel. And no, he's never been hammered with it for barking or spinning or nothing. It just really makes him think a little bit and calms him down. So the vibration only collar is, is great for that. With that being said, I tried it on several dogs, multiple dogs, all different issues, all kinds of behaviors. And I conditioned them to the, to the e-collar, the vibration only collar, you know, just like I would the e-collar over and over. And they were doing well. It really was. At first I was like, okay, maybe this is not so bad. But what happened, guys, even with soft dogs, let's take Emmy, for example. She was incredibly soft. She could feel the vibration collar on a number one. That sensitive she was. And she was good off leash. She was off leash in front of my house and had her nose in the ground. And when I went to use that vibration only collar at a level 100, didn't phase her. And that was just from a smell on my property, you know, and, and that's, that was my point. I wanted to give it a fair shot, but when it all comes down to it, I'm a big believer in the e-collar and I don't need to step away from it. Okay. I believe in it wholeheartedly when it's used properly and humanely. And if your dog's going to be off leash, there has to be some kind of safety net there for that what if moment. And the vibration collar just doesn't provide that. Like I said earlier, there are places where the vibration only collar will work fine, but in real life, off leash, you got to use the e collar, not the vibration, okay? All right, let me see. My wife gets more aggressive every time I have one on her. How do I condition her through that? Aha, uh -huh, can't wait to see the video. Well, 
your communication is not very strong with your wife. You got to build that bond in that relationship. And I'll talk to you privately about that, okay? Uh, just kid kidding. I've watched a lot of your videos, but concentrated mainly on the ones. This is Brandon. I've watched a lot of your videos, but concentrated mainly on the ones with the use of the e-collar. Short story, I have the collar, watched the videos, and worked with the dog four or five times a week for short periods. My seven-month-old German Shepherd has started to ignore the signal off-leash, but responds relatively well without it. Do I go back to square one with training or continue to go forward with it? Recall is her worst problem. Okay, thank you. Keep up the good work. Absolutely, Brandon. Four or five short sessions a week is not enough. Not even close. There's still confusion there and the dog doesn't understand it. So go back to the start, start over, condition the dog properly. You know, four or five short sessions a day is great, but four or five short times a week, it's not enough. You're moving way too fast. Start from the beginning, take a little more time, okay? Um, have you ever had trouble with an e-collar in a house? The other night as a client and the collar was 100% charged and working, I couldn't get it to work on the dog at all because the client works in wireless communications. He said that it was because there was too much going on and the frequency the collar was on. Uh, I'm not a tech guy, Corey, but I don't think that would be the case. Um, there are times, rare times, where an e-collar will work off another e-collar's frequency and you could have a problem. I've seen it before, but it's very rare. I don't think that was an issue, but again, I'm not much of a tech guy, and if there was something different in that house that he had going on with a lot of stuff, maybe, but I wouldn't count on it. I really wouldn't, but I could totally be wrong on that, you know? Um, yeah, I worked on the dog in the kitchen. I worked on the dog in the kitchen, but not in the living room. Very odd. Hmm. Interesting. It worked outside as well. All right. Let's see. If a dog has been trained on an e-collar, this is Bridget. If a dog has been trained on an e-collar done wrong, how do you retrain or do it over? What steps are different? Okay, Bridget. Yeah. And I have a chapter in that about my book. I've made videos about it. Um, for a long time, a good percentage of my dogs, I'm talking like almost 70%, you know, before people in the area knew about me a little bit, um, a big percentage of the dogs I got were already trained on an e-collar and it, a lot of bad training, a lot of bad training. Um, I don't do anything different. I start from day one, like the dogs never had an e-collar on and they all turn around. I've never had one not turn around even the worst cases again i did a chapter in my book about that and even the worst abuse cases with an e-collar yes i said abuse because there are people out there that do that guys it, not a lot but there are some and i had a couple okay and it was from an individual in this area same dude that was robbing soldiers he's no longer in business but i had a pretty bad case where a pit bull and i think that's in my book also i wrote about it and even that dog came out now, with that being said, the most difficult dogs, there's a lot of underground fence use in this area. Those dogs are usually a little different when they first feel it because they all freeze, okay? But it's not a big deal. It's never difficult to get the underground fences dogs over the hump. What is difficult is when you have a dog that has an underground fence and they've blown through it many times and have had bad experience, like really bad. Heike, the Rottweiler, was one of them. Her response to the e-collar on the lowest levels was the worst I had ever seen. As soon as she felt it, she was trying to escape and get back in my house. It was tough. I had to work really hard. And so a lot of people said to me about that, well, then why continue to use it? Well, it's, it's very simple. That dog has things going up in her head that shouldn't be there. It's not necessary. If someone's paying me a lot of money, it's my job to fix those issues. I have to fix the mindset. Okay, so not only did I have to get her comfortable and okay 100% with the e-collar and get her off leash and comfortable to where we're using all aspects, but I also had to make sure I brought her drive back. Okay, because a dog like that, you put the e-collar on, there's no ball drive, there's no bite drive, there's nothing. You see a zombie walking back from place board to place board, you know, and I'll never do that. It was difficult to get her drive built back up, but you guys saw her. You saw her doing bite work. You saw her doing all kinds of things. That was a difficult one. They all come out of it, Bridget. Some of them just take a little more work, okay? All right, let me see. 
Do you ever use tone or vibrate function on the e-collar? We talked about that. I don't. I have no use to. I, I just, I don't. Um, listen, there's, there's folks out there I know that, from what I understand, are doing really good work with the vibration stuff. Have at it. You know, power to you. I don't have an issue with it. It's not for me. Okay, I'm a big fan of the e-collar. I don't need to take a step back to make anyone feel more comfortable, including myself. I'm very, very confident in the proper use of the tool. All right. Um, and you guys see, you see how I use it. You see the dogs, you see their response. You see their response. You see what I'm doing. Okay. Um, I don't have any special qualities that anyone else has. Everyone's capable of doing it. Uh, my five and a half old, this is Michael, my five and a half month old German Shepherd responds well on a number eight with the mini educator. He is glued to my side and I can't create any separation or distance between us. I've seen many of your videos where the dogs create their own distance and seem occupied with other things going on around. How do I create distance? Okay, Michael, I have made videos about that. Okay. There are several things you can do. First of all, in the conditioning phase, we do four different things, right? When the dog is away from us, we hold the continuous button down, we give the command to turn, the dog turns, we mark it and reward, right? When the dog won't leave our side, two different things we do. We walk with the dog next to us at a good pace and we do the 180s where we turn the opposite direction and we just tap, tap. For that example, I don't use commands, I don't use rewards. Again, this is in my book, this is in, you know, 300 different videos I've done, we've broke it down many times. Right. The third thing we do is when we're walking at a good pace, we just hit the brakes and back right up calling the dog to us. That automatically, that momentum creates space for the dog. So when I decide which one of them I'm going to play into, it depends what the dog gives me. If the dog doesn't give me space, well, then I'm going to do one of those two things, either the turnabouts, the 180 degrees, or I'm going to, as we're walking, I'm going to back straight up and call the dog. Both create some kind of space. The other thing you could do is if the dog's food motivated, you take a little food by the nose, you throw it away a little bit. You let the dog go get the food. When the dog's away from you getting the food, then you practice the recall from there, okay? That's how you create distance. I do have videos showing that, okay? Um, was it? Who was that? Michael? I, I have videos, and I, ha I think I talk about that in, in my book also, okay? Um, Mark, would you explain to me how or if the e-collar can help solve issues within the home, excessive barking, jumping, counter surfing, all easy stuff, Mark. Just put the time in to teach the dog properly and allow the dog to learn. Then once the dog truly understands, stopping those things are instant. You can correct those behaviors instantly without any negative blowback. So I've heard people say before that I don't use the e-collar for corrections or punishment. Not true at all, not true at all. The thing is when the training's good, you're going to find yourself using a lot less corrections, okay? Um, I'm never going to use the e-collar as a correction or punishment up and through the conditioning phase and as the dog's learning. I just, I just don't. And what happens, guys, is too many people are putting the dogs in the situations they have problems with. So if a dog comes to me, let's say they're dog reactive, and I start the training on day one, that dog's not going to be put in that situation to become dog reactive for at least a week, at least, if not longer. I'm going to have the trust of that dog. I'm going to have that relationship laid and I'm going to have a good training foundation laid for that dog, including the e-collar work. Now, once that dog is actually introduced to that situation that used to create that reactivity, a couple of things happen. Either the reactivity is completely gone, you don't have to do anything, or it's so much less powerful, you know, less aggressive than it was before. And at that time, once I have that laid for the dog, if I do have to correct the dog or punish the dog, it has a lot more meaning than it would on day one, I promise you, okay? If I just raise my voice to a dog after a week or two of being with me, they're like, whoa, they just wanna please, guys. They just wanna please, you know? A lot of times they don't know how to, but if you give them that chance, the corrections you find yourself using are gonna be less and less. Do I have a problem with corrections? Absolutely not. Do I use the e-collar to correct dogs if I have to? Absolutely. But the thing is, guys, I don't have to do it very often. I, I just don't. And I don't just talk about it. I show you guys. I've shown you guys over and over and over. It's not exciting. But once the dog gets it, the dog gets it. You understand what I'm saying? All right. Um, 
Daniel says, what are your prerequisites for your client or dog that you need before using the e-collar? It's real simple, Daniel. The client has to understand it completely, okay? Um, if I do a board and train, the dog's already trained. It makes it a little easier. If I do private lessons, a lot of that falls on the client, all right? I can't allow that client to leave after the first time we put the e-collar on the dog without being very comfortable. So I made the video years ago when Sophia was young. You guys know how I do that. The client holds the e-collar. I treat them like the dog. They start to understand the timing and the mechanics, right? Then I hold the e-collar. I'm the dog and they make all the mistakes on me. They make a lot of mistakes before they ever get to work the dog. Once they're comfortable working me, then we can go ahead and work the dog, okay? With that being said, guys, when I send a client home for, the, for that first week, after that first lesson, I ask them to do a few things when it comes to the training. I'm not even going to say homework because it's not a lot. I keep it so simple and so basic for the client that for one, they're always going to do it because it doesn't take much effort. They would feel like dirtbags if they didn't. And for two, I make it with the mindset that they're going to mess it up. They're going to make a ton of mistakes. But the way I lay it out is when they make all the mistakes, it's not going to affect the dog in any negative way, usually. All right. I keep it very simple. Now, with that being said, I'm working with an awesome couple right now. Awesome couple. They have a young German Shepherd, six months old, I think he is, working lines, you know. He's getting a little dog reactive, doing very good with the training. And the owners are just great people and as committed as you could ask for. So before I left on my trip to New York, we started the e-collar training. We had had three or four lessons before, you know, all the obedience is going well, but we started the e-collar. I did that first lesson, you know, I worked with the owners quite a bit. They worked with me, all that stuff. And then, uh, you know, I gave them the work to do for that week. And I knew I was going to be traveling to New York and I was going to be gone for a while. So I wanted to make it there before I left to make sure they were doing everything correct after the first few days. And I never made it. My trip got scheduled a little earlier and I had to leave. So when I went there yesterday or the day before, he said, okay, let's go outside. Let's see where you're at. Immediately, I saw that there was something wrong. I didn't like the way the dog looked. You know, the head was down. He was hesitant. There was confusion. Now, when the dog looks like that with the e-collar work, one of two things happened. Either the training was very harsh, very heavy-handed, or there's a lot of confusion. I know these owners, and I, so I knew the training wasn't heavy-handed. That wasn't even a question, so I knew there was going to be confusion because the dog was telling me. You know, he looked at me like, there's confusion. I said, okay, well, let's, let's talk about this there, buddy. And so I, I asked him, all right, show me what you were doing and explain. And he did, and he was doing it all wrong. And just the timing was a little off, and it was a, a, not exactly how we taught it. So just that slight change made a ton of confusion for the dog, and it showed. And I explained, okay, totally wrong. This is where you're going wrong. And uh, basically what he was doing was using the e-collar just as a signal, as a tap, stopping, and then giving the command. And the dog just didn't understand how to operate through that. So it took me five minutes to fix that. Five minutes of working the e-collar a lot with the dog. The head was up, tail was going, and he was happy. We just made it very clear for the dog, okay? That's it. Very, very simple. Um, let me see. So that's my prerequisites, Daniel. You know, the, do the, the owners have to have pretty good knowledge. And again, when I send someone home, what I tell people is you're going to make mistakes all week long. It's normal. Everyone's going to make mistakes. It's okay. Just get the repetitions in. Week two, we fix those mistakes, okay? All right, let me see. On green dogs, can you condition, this is Irwin. On green dogs, can you condition an e-collar along the conditioning of prong, flat, slip, how much pressure release understanding? You can, but I don't, and here's why. And this is just me, don't get mad at me, you know, prong collar users and all that stuff. I don't bother with that. Well, I shouldn't say that because I do a lot of leash work with flat buckle collar. I do. So I do use a flat buckle collar. That's what the dog usually comes with. That's all I use until I go to the e-collar. Um, when you see me use slip leads or slip collars, it's because the dog has the aggression issues or I'm just scared that a dog's going to take off. That's it. For me, the e-collar is by far the superior tool to all them, you know, and, and prong collar is the one it's usually paired to. And so, 
can you teach the pressure with the prong collar? Yeah, there's nothing wrong with it, guys. Absolutely nothing wrong with it, you know? And it's not a bad thing. In many cases, it's a good thing. I just don't because I don't use prong collars. When I do use prong collars, it's usually in the working dog world with people that are competing and have been using them. But with regular pet folks, I get too many people that show up with prong collars on guys and the dogs are just batshit crazy with all kinds of issues and aggression issues and reactivity. And a lot of that stuff changes quite a bit as soon as we remove the prong collar. Because just like the e-collar, too many people slap the prong collar on the dog and it's yank and crank right from the start, okay? If you're gonna use it that way, just like with the e-collar, you're gonna struggle and the dog's going to struggle, okay? All right, German Shep Max, how you doing, buddy? When you are weaning the dog off the e-collar, do you ever use a dummy on his collar so you don't blow you off? Nah, I don't play any tricks or anything, Max. I don't, I don't do that, you know? When I'm weaning the dog off the e-collar, that's what the intermittent phase is for. That's where we're teaching the dog to respond where the e-collar is on or off. And you guys see my dogs. The only time you ever see an e-collar on my dogs is when we're doing an e-collar video and I'm trying to explain or show something. But don't rush through that intermittent phase. That's where you're training the dog to listen whether the e-collar is there or not. But no, I don't do that. I also don't put the e-collar on and let him wear it for a week or two to get used to that. I start right away. All right, Tamara, if you, if you have your personal dog out, Mango or whoever, do you have the e-collar on majority of the time or only when you are training? It's your personal dog wearing the collar daily regardless of age. I watch your videos all the time. Have a goal to come out to you next seminar and get personal lesson from you. Thanks for sharing. Thanks, Tamara. Appreciate it. Here's the thing, guys. I could take my dogs anywhere. Um, I wouldn't do it with Mango, she's too young, but I could take my dogs anywhere and have them off leash in public. I can go to Times Square with them with no tools and I don't have to worry. They're going to be, they're going to listen to me no matter what. Um, my dogs don't care about what's going on. With that being said, if I'm going out in public, my dog's going to have an e-collar on. Again, you have to prepare for what if. Very simple. You have to prepare for what if. You have to be responsible and worry about the safety of the dog. That's simple. If I did that, if I took them all over off leash with no eco, that's an ego thing. That's me showing people, look, I don't need any tools. And that's not good for the dog, okay? Because you just never know, guys. You, you never know. Always better to have it on. Um, no, my dogs don't have it on around the house. When we're training and we're conditioning the e-collar when we're training, they'll have it on more throughout the day. You know, it make, becomes a regular part of their life. But uh, that's, my dogs don't see e-collars very often. If we're going someplace, if I'm going someplace with Luca, and I'll put an e-collar on him no matter what, because like I said, it settles him down. It really calms him and allows him to focus a little more. If I don't, and we're in the car, he's batshit crazy because he's so worked up and it's not healthy for him. The e-collar settles him down, and Luca's never been corrected at a high level with the e-collar, never. But it allows him to think and, and, and really just levels his thinking out. And, and that's, a, that's a great tool to have, okay? Let's see. Is that about it now, guys? Let me see if I got any more here. Uh, comment on your post. Can you have someone else lead the dog away from you? I have trouble with this as well. Well, we talked about that, okay? Dog, Katie says, this tiny booger was glued to me at young age too. Didn't even have to use the leash and turn. All right. Um, is that it? I think that's all the questions. Let me see. Oh, I see view more comments. Richard Chen. Hey, Larry, can you please talk about the concept of using the e-collar to nick with the command to motivate a dog? I recall one of Bart Ballone's videos where he says he goes from continuous eventually to nick per command. This makes the dog think he's performing the command so fast that he's beating it, thus motivating him. Uh, concept of using. Yeah, and, and the reason I don't use the nick during the conditioning phase, Richard, is exactly because of that, exactly what you're saying. It's so fast that a lot of times the dog in the conditioning phase barely feels it, okay? I mean, barely, a lot of times they act like they don't feel it. With that being said, every now and then, you get a dog that responds better to the nick right from the start. But as far as motivating the dog, yeah, abs absolutely. You know, I, I have to agree with that. Um, those short little taps with the nick, it's so fast and it definitely helps to motivate the dog. 
um, especially on, on precision things like competition style healing stuff. Absolutely. All right. Let's see. Let's see if we got any more. I should probably start wrapping this up here. Oh man, this has gone kind of long. We're at 40 minutes. No one's going to want to watch this for 40 minutes. Um, if you have your personal dog, I think that's about it guys. Okay. I think if not, we'll stop. And here's the thing, guys, I put so much stuff out about the e-collar, um, because it's something I'm truly passionate about. I'm so vocal because I don't want us to lose the tool. Personally, I don't care for a personal standpoint, but if we lose the tool, a lot more dogs are going to lose their lives. It's just a fact. So the anti-e-collar people out there, I don't have a personal thing against them. The ones that hate the tool because of what they've been told, what they believe. A lot of them don't have any um, bad intentions. They just don't know. The ones I have an issue with are the ones that make up lies and stories and put out false information. You know, that is very detrimental to everyone and there's no place for it. I put out so many first e-collar sessions because I think it's so important for people to see what the dog looks like, what it's going through. I really do. So I do my part to put out as much stuff, putting the tool in a good light. I really do. I try to. I've been so vocal about it. Um, we're at a point now, guys, where we're at a constant battle with this tool. And if we're going to keep it and stop worrying about losing it, then we have to be proactive. We can't wait till it's on the chopping block and we're about to lose it and then speak up. You got to do something now. And the best thing I know how to do is stop using it incorrectly, educate as many people as possible, and show the good that the tool can do. Are there people doing bad with it? Of course. But there's people doing bad with leashes and flat buckle collars, you know, and baseball bats and, and everything. There is. So you have to remember that. You take away the e-collar, it's not going to stop mistreatment of animals. If someone's misusing, uh, you know, mistreating a dog with an e-collar, they're doing it with other things too. It's not going to change anything. It's not. It's not going to change anything. So always train humane, you know. If you take your time, guys, and teach the dog and train the dog and motivate the dog, then add the tool. Then the tool is allowed to do exactly what it was created for in the best light possible. And you stop given these cuckoo birds, you know, ammunition. I haven't had a lot of attacks from purely positive people because I don't give them a lot of ammunition. You know, a couple of years ago, I did an interview, an e-collar interview on a radio station. You know, it was a radio station about dog stuff. And there was a list of, if I remember correctly, you know, like 25 questions or something. And there were basically questions that came from the purely positive, the anti-e-collar people that, you know, basically if you do this with an e-collar, you're going to create this in the dog. If you do this, this is going to happen. And the people interviewing me were kind of surprised because out of like the 25 questions, I think 23 or 24 with them I agreed with. I said, yeah, they're right. That, that, that is what will happen. But what people have to understand, reputable skilled trainers aren't using the e-collar that way to create those problems. I think the only question I disagreed with or statement was if you put an e-collar on your dog, you can burn holes in his neck. You know, that's when I said, no, that's total fallacy that's made up but i did agree with all the statements but they using those statements as if this is how we train with the e-collar and that's why for me it's it's important for me not to put the e-collar on the dog and teach the obedience with the e-collar because then you're always going to have that that stigma stigma attached to you that the dog only does that because it has to and that's a problem that hurts us that hurts everyone using the tools I had a, a troll on, on Mango's video the other day. You know, guy was a real douchebag. You know, he, I, he didn't even make sense, but he said something like, everything I taught that dog was done through purely, you know, positive reinforcement, but I'm trying to, to sell e-collar and prong collar work. Like, that's how that dog got like that. And I said, actually, no, it's not. People have seen the training, and I've said it a million times before, everything I teach my dogs or clients' dog is done through positive reinforcement. Everything. That's how I teach. A lot of motivation, food, toys, praise, affection. That's how I teach things. But I also use e-collars. 
And I use e-collars to provide dogs that freedom, that off-leash freedom that all dogs need. Dogs are not meant to be kept on a leash or, you know, stuck in a backyard. Also, our shelters are slammed with dogs. We kill millions of dogs a year, okay? It's a damn shame that we're not educating more and more people because a lot of those dogs don't have to be there. But there's organizations out there that would literally rather put a dog down than train a dog with corrections or tools. And for me, I can't understand that. That blows my mind. So I challenge anyone to take me on, anti-e-collar people. Come out and see what, you, see what I do. Every workshop I've ever done, I've had purely positive people come to my workshops. You know, and a couple of them told me, I came here to hate you. Every single one has left with a positive attitude and they became e-collar users. Think about that. They came thinking they were going to see me do something completely different with the e-collar. They thought they were going to see all kinds of e-collar stuff and they were going to see dogs just yelping and using corrections and forcing dogs. They never see that, you know. Even the ones at the last thing that did see that insane pit bull, what did I do with that dog? Right from the start, I had to hit that dog on a very high level, something I never do and I'm very vocal about. That's what that dog needed at that time. When you have a dog that's attacking statues that look like a dog, that's a problem. These people understood that. And they were blown away by how the weekend went. And so a lot of times people say, can these people change? Absolutely, because I deal with them all the time. I see them. I meet them. I talk to them. They change all the time. I get the emails. It's what keeps me doing this. You know, I swore after a little while, not too long ago, I wasn't going to do any more e-collar. I wasn't going to talk. It gets old, guys. I don't want to be one of those guys that just put shit out every day to put stuff out. I don't want to do that, you know. But we're getting to a point here. I'm still being asked a ton of questions about the use of the tool. And if I'm still being asked all these questions, that's a problem. You know, we got to straighten that out. We have to save the tool. We have to save all tools. We have to save our right to train dogs as we want, as long as we're doing it humanely and fairly. That's it. Okay, and if we lose these tools, a lot more dogs will die. It's that simple, and that's something I have a real problem with. So uh, I won't, I won't go ahead and and answer any more questions. If I have to do more questions, I will. We'll keep it short. I'm sorry this ran. I thought 15 minutes, but we're we're over 47 minutes. So I'll stop now. It's Friday. Go out, enjoy yourself. Have fun with your dog. Tomorrow's not guaranteed, okay? We're losing a lot of young people. Not good, all right? Nothing but best wishes. Peace.